Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Brialt, CMO at Aprimo, and I'm delighted today to have a friend on, uh, Nas Urbina. Nas, welcome to the show. Hi, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. And you're not just my friend. You're kind of a big deal in the content community. Uh, typically, you're on big stages. You're uh, an international keynote speaker. You're a founder of the Omni Channel X conference, mm -hmm. which is an awesome place for knowledge, content, and next level thought leadership. Author, content strategist, keynote uh, <laughs> speaker, and my favorite, which is a futurist. You're going to make me turn pink. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> So how does one become a futurist? Um, I want to talk about you a little bit, Nas, and we'll get into some uh, some interesting topics here, uh, some that are on a lot of people's minds. But um, take me back to the beginning with you and take me through a little bit of your career arc. Um, and what did that look like? How did you sort of pave the way to where you are today? Well, um, it's been a been a combination of of luck and leaping on opportunities as they came so uh it's if, if we keep it to the kind of the, there's there's lots of drama to the beginning of my career um i you know i i was uh, just a little a little bit of color i was working in a, in a pizza shop and there was a break-in in the middle of the night and that caused me to go make an application to a different job and then yeah. i ended up in europe <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. Um, yeah, so I was uh, just born and raised there, and then very, very early in my career, due to uh, quite a unexpected series of events, I ended up uh, applying for a job in London, and I went over to this very small, very niche organization. Um, where, well, very small. It was it's 100, 120 people, so you know, not a major enterprise. Uh, but I had landed myself right at the right at the burst of the dot com bubble, uh, right 2000 2001. Landed myself in a company which just had this incredible vision, and uh, one of the one of the best things for me was this incredible um, attraction for for staff. So mm -hmm. I was moved from university straight into creating what we call what we now call uh, structured content. Um, also called intelligent content, um, very much related to uh, micro content or atomic content. Basically, the content that works um, on its own and it's ready for multiple contexts, multiple formats, multiple channels, multiple uh, personalization, automation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was doing this in, the, we're now 22 years ago. Um, that, yeah. So, so you, this is nothing new. A lot of these topics aren't new. You've, you've started some of these very, what's advanced for some organizations. They might still not be ready for it, but they're aspiring state. You've been doing this for over 20 years. Exactly. So if you can imagine in, a, in an industry like internet and content and communications, I, have, I was at somewhere where 20 years ago, we were ahead of now. So this, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a new graduate, this is an incredible opportunity to work with these visionary people. And like, oh, I, get, I got to like personally meet and hang out with people who were setting web standards that, you know, they were, they were on the, the commissions who were designing the standards that power the, the modern internet and what we, the semantic web, semantic you know, web. these things that are now becoming uh, or getting, gaining awareness. I was there as a kid getting to hang out with all these people and having them take me under their wing, um, show me what conferences to go to, teach me like. The philosophies of these 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 um, these methodologies from from the ground up. So that's how kind of I got to become a futurist. Was well, first of all, I have a, I have a passion for it, and there's more about what being a futurist is. But I just got to say that I just happened to land by luck in this this organization that was trying to bring this structured content stuff to the masses. 22 years ago, they were creating an authoring tool where you could sit down and write just like you would do in a word processor. But when you hit save, you were getting a fully structured document that could then be processed and output in any format on any channel, sent to text for speech, um, be personalized, filtered, reformatted, all this stuff. 
So that that just kind of positioned me automatically to be ahead of the market. And I, I didn't even realize. Yeah. Because I, I remember I started going on uh, eventually, like years later, because I was in this tiny little uh, niche of the market. I started working on more general web projects, digital projects. And I was going, what are you guys doing? Why do you do it this way? Like, this is so inefficient and there's so much room for error. You're going to get sued. You know, the doc, none of the pages look consistent. The brand's all over the place. What's going on here? And, th and that was already 15 years ago. So, no, it's been a very interesting journey to see how there's a, there, and I think this is always the case. There's always a little community of super brains in some corner who are developing the stuff that will, will eventually take over the world. And I happen to be there at the right time. So a cheat code right there is start 20 years before everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you know, I, for me, the cheat code on that one is humility. You know, take the opportunity to meet and greet and learn from people. You know, we can, we can often in our careers kind of be trying to, especially early in our career, be so desperate to, to show how smart we are. Find the smart people learn from them, you know, hang out with them, see, see, even if they're, especially the really big brains, they're sometimes kind of weird people, like, but hang out with some people that, and, and find out what they're all about and how they think, um, rather than trying to, you know, be the most cool or exciting voice in the room, because eventually it will be. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So the semantic web, which is now being changed, evolved by web with web 3.0, I, I want to talk about that, how like the you know, machine readable uh, components of it. But before we get there, this is marketing cheat codes. We'd like to talk about any video game experience in, you know, the true sense of a cheat code being used. Did, did Nas Urbina ever play video games? And if you did. Oh, yeah. Give me I, one. I, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I got to say, I still, what I do is I, I, I'm, I'm very monogamous with my games. I will choose one game and I will play only that for three or four or five years, and then I'll switch to another one. So I got one game, I've played maybe four games really uh, consistently in the past 15 years. Nice, get all the levels. Yeah, just you know, focus. That's awesome. All right, so um, Nas, let's talk about the progression of the internet. So cheat code one, start 20 years before everybody else. Uh, cheat code two, surround yourself with extremely brilliant people. Um, there's got to be some cheat codes here in uh, one of the things you like to talk about is uh, the progression of the internet, the usability of the internet, how that thing might change. I know we want to talk about the web 1.0, web 2.0, web 3.0. Talk to me, t take me through that 1.0 to where we are today, web 3.0. We might be here for 10 years. I don't know. I'd like to get your opinion on that too. Um, talk me through that progression. Right. So I'll, I'll start with a cheat code and then we'll work backwards. Okay. So the cheat code is technology will always advance to be ergonomic. It's, you know, usable is usable by humans, by the human body, by the human brain. So if you look at the internet, it has been a progression from uh, what I call, what, what are called, not what I call, from abstractions, you know, things that are indirect to becoming more direct. So the, the internet uh, uh, started as uh, online documents. We created web pages, like, and they were pages. They were as pagey as a page of paper, <laughs> um, but they were just, you could browse them through a browser. And so that was already amazing. So the web started as literally pages and the idea of a hyperlink. So we could go from a point in one page to a point in another page. That was amazing to be able to browse information that was exposed all over the world um, from the seat of your, you know, seat of your living room. That that was uh, enough to power the power the web 1.0 re revolution because suddenly the brands could put their information out there and anybody could get it anywhere. And you know you could self serve, and you could research, and you could find out about things, and you could educate yourself. And so that was Web uh, 1.0, but it was still a, a publisher audience world. 
You know, mm -hmm. if you published, if you knew how to create a web page, which is which you had to have the know-how back then. If you had, if you knew how to create a web page, then you could become a publisher, and other people could be your consumers. But it was a, it was kind of a one-way thing. Uh, there was the idea of logging into a site as we take totally for granted now, mm -hmm. um, and the and social uh, social experiences online uh, didn't exist in Web 1.0. You were reading people's pages. We get there in 2.0, correct? So yeah, so the transition to 2.0 was when you stopped being a reader and you started being you. You could mm -hmm. create profiles, you could log into stuff, you could post things uh, much more easily. And then the web stopped being a document repository and the web became um, interactive. It became uh, uh, an application. So all these things that we can do in the browser today, like Google Docs, or um, you know, you, you get applications where you, or Spotify, you can't even tell the difference basically um, whether it's wrapped in a web browser or whether you're looking at the the, the app. There's full interactivity um, on pages. So that's Web 2.0, and what that changed was by bringing identity onto the web, you powered a new type of business. So um, I, you know, just about any major brand you can think of. Um, uh, Amazon or Airbnb or um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, Facebook, any of these, any any of these brands, they exist because of user generated content. Like I can't rent my Airbnb without reviews. I can't sell my product on 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 Amazon without reviews. So the the interactivity and the social aspect, the social proof of web 2.0 ushered in this whole new type of business. We had we could trust this, these web pages all of a sudden, and that allowed us to do business in a way that we never could before. If, if you hang out on that, what's, what's your thoughts on ownership though? The, I'll call it the, who owns you, you now? I think, in, would you say that in a web 2.0 world, you give up your content and the platform owns your content or and or owns you? It's sort of like this exchange. 3.0 does it potentially go away like that? But in terms of ownership in a 2.0 world, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? So it's it, we've all heard the phrase, you know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. You are the product. Yeah. yeah. So the what, what the, the when the web started, and I remember this like back in the day in, the, in these tiny little conferences. It was all very hippy dippy, and we were creating this online utopia where we were freeing human thought to from time and space to be able to extend across the cosmos. Blah blah blah. blah. Um, and then somebody had to pay for all this stuff. And so once we got Web 2.0 and all this data became available, the advertising model took over. And so um, the web was generally free. But to keep up with demand, somebody's got to be paying for it somehow. And so ads went from the newspapers and TV onto the web. And yes, so you essentially were are, are locked in. So there's the major players, and they're, you know, you can count them on your fingers, who are taking over the entire planet because they own the data. Data is the new uh, oil. It is, it is what is powering the ind industry of today. Whoever has the data rules the world, as it were. Um, and we even see this bridging into politics. Countries like China are very focused on making sure they get that data um, because they know that data is power. And when we trans, what's happening with the transition with Web 3.0 is we don't need, we won't need these central nodes like, uh, like Google or Facebook um, to be the arbiters of our communication. Uh, for, I think we got to pause here to say what the hell is Web 3.0. Yeah, and I remember back in, in the I remember Facebook when we were all asking questions. How's Zuckerberg going to monetize it? Then he started the advertising, and then now look what just happened with Meta. Like all that value is gone because now the decisions of your data are now put back into the uh, the 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 ownership of the the user. Yeah, no, and it's it's been bad, you know, it's been very difficult. I have a lot of feelings about the power of the algorithm 
and the fact that all of human culture worldwide is kind of being arbitrated by a few companies from Silicon Valley. You know, that's not cool. Um, and I'm and I see it. You know, I live in Europe. I, I'm seeing how the, um, for example, the censorship rules of Instagram affect local culture in Paris. But it's it changes the way that we we think about everything. Um, and that happens because there's these central nodes. There's these companies that provide you a platform in order to be able to express yourself. And in the same way that the, when the web started, you really had to have a huge amount of know-how and, and money and all this stuff to launch a web page. You can't launch really an application today. You know, you have to have these providers who allow you the access to their applications so that you can socialize, you know? And it's like, unless you do, unless you play their game, you're not allowed to play with anybody. Yeah, and you said centralized, and now to get into three it's decentralized. That's the buzzword. So, well, it's not the buzzword. That's the that's the main concept. Um, so, let me pause. It. What is Web three point oh? Um, and I'm going to try to give you a non nonsense explanation of blockchain, which uh, I, I'm sure I've already lost some of the listeners because blockchain is like the buzziest, broiest word out there right now. <laughs> You know, it's, and it's immediately associated with cryptocurrencies. But okay, let's let's come back to basics. What is Web 3.0? Right now, when I'm going on a, on a uh, on one of these applications, the, it's the application, it's the application provider, Google, Facebook, um, Airbnb, Hulu, whomever. They they are the ones who connect me to the content. They are the ones who allow me to participate in this world. What if there is a way? that we didn't need third parties to be able to do that. What if you and I, not knowing each other, could establish a system of trust where we could actually build things together, not using these, these, these major powers? And so the, the, what's happened with, uh, with, with the internet is we, we've been, had this progression towards trust. At the beginning, anybody could publish. There you had some very funky websites, they didn't get much traffic. Most of it was going to big institutions, governments, libraries. And then we had social media and the, the, the barrier to entry for publishing went down and, we're and took us to where we are now, where we're, where we're in a major trust problem because you cannot trust the content out there anymore. And uh, working together is based on trust. Business is based on trust. Absolutely. So let's talk about how we establish trust with anything, you know, we have to know stuff about each other. And usually the way we establish trust is getting to know each other a lot till we feel we can trust each other. If we take a system where we're all gonna have a plan, let's say we're all planning a, 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 a big joint function, or we're gonna have a shared budget. How do you keep track of who spent what and what's been happened, what's happened on this big collaborative project? Like we're all, we're going to throw a big, huge catered barbecue where all people are different, paying for different things like taxis and shipping and decorations and tables and blah, blah. How do we keep track of it all? So let's set up a system where we all have to email everybody in the team with every transaction that you uh, are going to, you're going to spend and you can't spend and that can't, transaction can't be officially part of the project unless somebody or everybody on the team emails back saying, yes, I approve. If you did that, then everybody in their individual inboxes has a whole history of everybody's proposals, uh, everybody's transactions, and everyone else agreeing that they, that they validated them. Right. So that way, we, everybody knows exactly what's happened. So we have complicit and, uh, and total trust in each other. Sounds like a ledger. That's a lot like a ledger. It's a, <laughs> it's, I don't like the word ledger because I don't think yeah. people know what the word ledger means. Right. Yeah. So I, I make a policy when I'm, when I'm trying to talk about concepts is never explain a concept with a more foreign concept. <laughs> Very good policy. So I'm sticking with email. So everybody's got their inbox. Everyone's got a full history. So I can trust every transaction that's happened. That is a blockchain. Everything that happens, everybody in the network has to agree this is a valid transaction. And then everyone keeps a copy. What that establishes is that now 
I, I don't have to know you at all because the, the crowd is validating things very specifically. I, I have complete trust in what's happened because I know that the crowd would not allow the transaction unless the crowd agreed and I'm part of the crowd. So th to be able to do this and then you layer on things like um, um, passwords and, and encryption on top of that, what that lets you to do is create these systems where we can exchange information, we can do business, and we can even start to expose services to each other because we have a, a, a system where we have total trust in the system. Therefore, I don't have to have any trust in you. I can fully trust that we're working in the same system and the system will protect me. So it sounds so, like there's some established agreement here. I agree if you do this, then I will do that. If we agree to the budget, then we will stay within budget. We'll stay uh, it, within an agreement. It's a, it's an agreement of sorts. Yeah. And so there's, there's all sorts of, there's, once you've got that basic system of, if you take the fundamentals is if we all have a copy, there's no way that you can alter the history without it being valid because I can go to anybody else on the network and say, okay, I'm going to compare my history with your history. It doesn't match Ed's history. So Ed's the one who's trying to screw us over here. So once you've got that, um, that system established, then you open up this ability to do just about anything. You can set up a contract so that the terms of the contract are embedded in this transaction system. So if anybody makes a move um, in relation to this thing we're putting together that doesn't comply with the rules that we programmed in a contract, the contract will automatically enforce itself. Is that the smart contract concept? Exactly. So yeah. it's a game. Everyone has a copy of the contract. Everyone has a copy of what the contract says. And then applications can look does this operation agree with the contract or not? So you can automate all sorts of business stuff. So Web 3.0 is because we have this trust system, now we can start building applications directly. You, can, you know how to process audio. You put your audio process out there and I can use it in my application. Um, I, know how to, I know how to do photos. So I'm gonna add photo, photo um, functionality. Somebody else knows how to do exchange rates. And so, Everybody can start to bypass these central providers and anybody who um, has the know-how can put a service out there. What's powerful about that is then people who don't have know-how can put together an application as easily as now you can put together a web page. Because you've got all these services which you can just piece together and say, I want to do this, this, and that in this order. And then I am now an application provider on the internet, which was is totally unthinkable today. Absolutely. What are some of the, okay, so web 3.0, what are some of the disadvantages? We're going to struggle here. We're not just going to get to everybody one day. Is gonna, we're all running web 3.0. It's going to be, it took us maybe, ten, we were in that like 2.0, to like 10 year span potentially. Uh, I'm not sure how, how long you would put us in there, but now we're on to 3.0. We're just the, in the early days of it. Technology moves exponentially humans like to change literally how long do you think we're going to be in this 3.0 stage well uh things if we if we take other technological advances they usually shave off you know 25 to 50 percent off the previous generations so they can be even faster so um like if you take the the um the exponential growth uh, so, but the, so we took the phases. We have we have the internet for twenty years of uh, twenty plus years of of one point oh, twenty five years to one point oh, then fifteen years of two point oh, three point oh is not. I wouldn't say it's here yet. I would say that it's in this in this same place where I was twenty years ago. It's on. It's in development. But because we have already all this other infrastructure that we're building on top of. I can see it being here within the decade. You know, it's 2022. So I can remember 2012 really well. So like yesterday. Yeah, like yesterday. So eight years can go by like that. So, but I think we're about a decade away where you're uh, from a point where we're able to expose the, these, these functions of the internet, create contracts with anybody in the world without lawyers and without even necessarily needing a legal entity to arbitrate for us. So we can do business internationally without having to worry about suing each other because we don't have to get governments or, or 
uh, legal involved. That that the full implications of that, I am not I'm not there yet. Um, I can talk about the experiential um, implications of this when you put it together with what we were talking about earlier, uh, the semantic web and the metaverse. So what is this all going to mean? Yeah. Is that we're in an internet now, which is truly everywhere. It's in our house. It's on my doorbell. It's on my dog. It's on my wrist. It's it, like the internet of things is, is like, I call it, it's gone deep inside the world, in, exactly. in our bodies, on our bodies. Exactly. And so um, I use the phrase that uh, the, the gesture is the query. So I said at the beginning of this, the cheat code is use, usability and experience will always move towards ergonomics. I was giving a presentation in 2011 about the future of uh, information and communication technologies. Oh, no. It wasn't 2011. It was like 2004. Yeah, so this is like 50, like a while ago. And um, we were there's talking about things like tablets. Uh, and uh, no, it couldn't be tablets yet. We we're talking about uh, about usability. And uh, the, the Bluetooth headsets. And the, the fact that these we love our Bluetooth headsets, and that was the way of the future because that is not as ergonomic as that. And that's a simple rule you can always come back to. So the internet as it is today, with keyboards and mice and pointers and screens, it's that is an interface to something that we're trying to get to. So it's this indirect way of interacting with things, typing and, and pointing and clicking, et cetera. So users always want it to be natural. So AR, augmented reality or mixed reality, has to happen because then we can just look around. You know, I don't search for information on the Eiffel Tower. I just look at the Eiffel Tower and I've got information. I, I don't I don't ask for extra information. I just point in the direction of the thing I'm most interested in. And then I get further progressive disclosure of information. The power of, of augmented reality to bring us this these superpowers of information are so tempting. And and for every generation who adopts them so easy that that is going to move really, really fast. Um, we saw this with mobile phones uh, in 2007 kind of thing, like a, right before the iPhone. Around that space, we saw this huge rush of, of, of phones, and then the and Apple always kind of comes in. When they see something that's a wave, they always come in and jump on top of it. That's it. That was the iPhone. So we're seeing the same thing now. These uh, Google tried to do Google Glass, I don't know. I didn't remember how many years ago, but a while ago now, and it went into the ground. Right. Too early. Too early. Microsoft does the same thing. Um, you want to cheat code? Stop pissing on Microsoft. Yeah. They, you know, they are, m w there's always this argument about innovation, and Apple has all this credit. I don't think that they're an innovative company at all. I think Microsoft is, is the most innovative of the big brands. They're always too innovative. You know, now we're doing chatbots. Microsoft tried to do Clippy. Right. <laughs> exactly. yeah, they tried to do Clippy. Microsoft, get, get, get off my screen, Clippy. Come on. <laughs> exactly. They screwed it up. It was too early. Yeah. yeah. But they are always there. They tried to do an internet connected coffee machine decades ago. They, they tried to do the internet of things. They're always trying to do all this stuff. Um, um, uh, what is that thing called? The on the Xbox, it's called the Connect, where you had the body motion tracking for the game. Yeah, it worked, but it, they couldn't get it to to fully function. So they're always so far ahead that they look like a joke. Yeah, I <laughs> saw. Yeah, I was at the Microsoft has a conference back in the days of actually going to the Staples Center and getting on planes when we could do that. Uh, Satya was uh, demonstrating. Um, the creation of virtual worlds. This was like four years ago. Yeah, you had the headset on, and it was it, there was holograms and virtual meetings, and this was this was not six months ago. This was over four years ago. Yeah, so they, they were they are on what they call Microsoft Hololens. Hololens, yeah, version two. 
So they did. it didn't collapse like Google Glass. They actually, they did it the Microsoft way where they targeted it at enterprise. So it's used in factories and it's used on oil fields and it's used in, in you know, airfields and it's working. You know, it's it's really taken off. And that is the is the seed which is going to eventually cause this all this competition. We're hearing about about now the Samsung and Apple, they're all there. They're all fighting behind the scenes to say, who's going to bring the Internet onto our faces first? Who's going to give us Terminator vision, you know, superpower X-ray vision um, into the Internet? That and that is um, inevitable. So let's talk about how ergonomics of technology how does a how can a brand approach this how can a what does it mean for for brands um for for creating experiences let's go there how can we start to how can organizations start to think about being more uh advanced and uh making it practical and not you know not getting over their skis and yeah Usability, so, utility. Yes. Yeah, so ironically, the we go back to the beginning of our conversation. So the the solutions that the brands need to invest in are the solutions that I was we were looking at 20 years ago when I first got into this game. Brands have to separate their knowledge and their assets from the channels. So ra- brands are still today parallel creating and handcrafting deliverables. Like they're making at their assets uh, in often a very desktop publishing kind of way where they're, they're like massaging together different words and different vi- and different uh, pieces of, uh, of video and, and text to create a thing and then they ship it like a clay pot. Brands have to start breaking down what they create into, its, in, into the raw assets. I often use the metaphor of Lego. You know, right. we have to break the stuff down so that we can provide on a web page, but we have a single source of truth based on our Lego pieces. So if we wanted to assemble it to deliver into the metaverse, it's able to do that. So the, the first step is, is rescue our, our assets from the, the channels and the formats and put them in a neutral source that's ready for everything. And that's been... True. We've been saying that since it was just PDF and web and then mobile and then apps and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's still the the first most fundamental step brands need to take. So modularity, atomization, some of those buzzwords to describe it, the the blocks, like the Lego blocks is very easy for us to sort of conceptualize. But how does, why do we... What's going to be the challenge for folks to get away from building the whole thing? Um, how do we get to that modular, componentized, atomized front end work? How do we start building blocks versus full experiences on the on the front end? Customer centricity. That you know we we've been saying it for ages. You know if we're gonna well, the the other way that you build trust is is empathy and attention. You know, we're still too much in a publishing mentality. We want to publish this message and so forth. And then each department wants to publish its message on its channels. We have to stop, step back and say, what does the customer want to know? What do they want to do? Let's build for that. What are the words? What are the assets that are going to satisfy those needs? Then you strap a layer on top of that saying, how are we going to deliver it? Those have to be separated. Separation of concerns. Um, and to get what I've seen to get this actually moving in a company is, is, is deep, careful customer journey mapping. Get total, people in a room. Total cheat code to get there is put your customer at the center of that. Totally. And because if you think about the customer experience rather than your own publishing and and processing concerns, then you open up opportunities to say, okay, well, they, they want this answer or they want this video or they want this image or they want this whatever, and they want it in all these places. So how do we plan to make sure it gets to all those places? And that automatically starts breaking down silos because it's not then the brochure and we're fighting over who handles 
you know, print brochures for events and who handles websites and who handles the intranet, we're, we're saying, okay, this is, this is an answer which the company has and the user wants. So, all right, team, we all huddle around the customer and say, okay, how do we get this person what they need? And that's a different way of thinking. It sets up different uh, governance. It sets up different uh, workflows and processes. And it implies uh, different w- ways to work with technology. You need technology that understands components and can serve them as a service around the organization, just like the blockchain thing we were talking about. You know, you got to set up this thing where I can expose my components to this department and they can expose some components to me and we can wrap them together in a UI and put them out into the world together. Wow. Going out into the world and like bring in this concept now for folks, that term omni-channel is, is now more real than it's ever been. It's no longer a, a buzzword of the past. It's literally what you just said, where those things are going is, has to be omni-channel. How would you, in, how would you describe omni-channel today and in moving into the future? So for me, the difference between multi-channel and omni-channel is exactly that, is customer centricity. So multi-channel is my ability to, to push stuff out on multiple channels and make sure that my customer can transact on each of those channels. Omnichannel is where the channels that I use, not all the channels, doesn't have to be all the channels that exist because nobody's on them, all. All the channels that I use, are they, are they telling a story coherently between all of them <laughs> that is more than the sum of its parts? Is the user getting the full experience actually improved when they use multiple channels together? Because I thought about they might be using their phone while they're at a location or while they're talking to a representative, or they might be looking at their screen while they're on the phone. Have I thought about that reality from the user's perspective and thought about how my channels support each other, wow. how they can move a transaction from their screen by scanning it onto their phone, then use their finger to digitally sign and then flick it back onto the screen. Have, have I built those experiences because I've thought about them at the center of my channels rather than my channels and their individual efficiency. That's the omni-channel thing. That's, if you look in Google, I go on Google Trends. You know, we, we called our conference Omnichannel X in 2019. And at, you know, everyone was saying, you know, are you sure you want to call it, name your name your conference after a buzzword? And I'm like, no <laughs> way this is going away. And you just watch Google Trends and it's been linear. It's been just, just keeps going. Wow. So omni-channel, the persistence of an experience across channels. Is that another way to attend? Well, I would, I would go more than persistence. It's, it's that the, the experience is actually assembling by using the multiple channels. You know, it's, it's built around the customer and that your experience is enhanced by the multiple channels. Re- consistency, it, for me, that's come back to multi-channel. I can do it on the phone. I can do it on the web. I can do it. Uh, you know, I can, I can do it talking to a person and it's consistent. That's good. You need to do that. You definitely need to do that. But if you properly leverage the channels, they start to become something more. The puzzle pieces start to become a, a picture and that's omnichannel. The user is at the center of this picture and the channels are creating something more than they could on their own. That's brilliant. Now, no, omnichannel X, I want you to plug that. Talk to me about Omni Channel X and your your vision for that and what's coming up. Happy to. So Omni Channel X, um, so uh, Urbina Consulting and Omni Channel X have the same mission. We're trying to help brands have the kind of relationships with people that people have with each other. You know that plugs into a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. You know how do you build a conversation with a brand and a human being? You know, thousands of people working all over the globe trying to have a relationship with one person or let's say a, a buying team. That's what our, that's what both my company and, and the event are about. We, we can't do it with my company. So we started the event to drive that conversation into the, you know, into the, into the world, drive the industry conversation. So Omnichannel X is it's online this year. It's been online for three years in a row due to the pandemic. Um, and it is a gathering of people who are looking at this, from the customer centric point of view. So a lot of, yes, there's a lot of marketing, a lot of content marketers, a lot of content people, but we're also trying to mix in the UX people, mix in some services people, um, sorry, not some services, some systems people. And we're trying to think about how do you, how do we collaborate on all this? How, how do we govern it all to create these unified experiences? 
So it's it's a futurist conference in a, in, a, in a sense, but it's bringing the people who have already been doing it for five, 10 years to talking to the people who are just learning how to do it today. And we're all getting everybody under one roof so we can learn from each other. I, I it's It's been awesome. We get uh, Microsoft, MasterCard, uh, Oracle, Adobe, uh, Google, um, Facebook. Um, you know, we get all the global brands and then we also get handpicked thought leaders who can explain this stuff in a relatable way to a mixed audience, you know, who, who are bringing together teams and, and help supporting collaboration. That's what we're all about at Omnichannel X. That's phenomenal. I'll be there. I was there in Amsterdam before um, pandemic. Uh, you were the first one ever. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Nas, thank you so much for coming on Marketing Cheat Codes. How can people, clearly we can Google you, but what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, first, I didn't. I can't finish my plug without saying June thirteenth to sixteenth this year, twenty twenty two. June sixth, thirteenth to sixteenth, Omni Channel X. Check it out. Um, we'll put, some, put some links in the description of this podcast for sure. Yeah, awesome. We'll do. And um, and the LinkedIn is my favorite way to get in touch. For, uh, get in touch on LinkedIn. Happy to chat. Always happy to have an exchange with somebody and toss around these kind of ideas. Phenomenal. He blew our minds. Um, awesome talk. Really appreciate it, Nas. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on it. <laughs>